Moras, and I want to say, you rock. Now, you're probably wondering, why in the world did that lady say, you rock? Well, I heard it a lot in my lifetime, but I never understood the meaning of it, how it really applied to me. You see, I grew up a military brat. I grew up in the Philippines. My mother's a Filipina, and my father is from the Ninth Ward of Louisiana. Does anyone know what the Ninth Ward of Louisiana is? It makes Harlem look normal. <laughs> so my father escaped the Ninth Ward. Just like our keynote speaker said he escaped, he ended up getting his degree, he got out. My father got out. And what he decided he was going to do, he would join the military so that he would see the world and get away from all the drug dealers and the gangbangers and just the terrible life that he was destined to have. And what this whole talk is about is that everybody goes through hard times. And I want you to remember that no matter how hard life is for you, you can rock, because I rock too. We all rock. What rock stands for is, well, we'll get to that later. Rock is an acronym for the four things that kept me going through my life. Growing up overseas, I did not know what America was. I thought America was what I saw. We were all brown. We all walked around in shorts and flip-flops. And we accepted each other for everything that we were. We were just us. It wasn't until I came to America that I realized that I was different. And this is how I found out. My parents got divorced. And my father sent me and my brothers and sisters to the Ninth Ward of Louisiana. Now, that is like taking an innocent chicken, little duckling, and dropping it into a lion's den. I had never seen rakes before, and they put me into an atmosphere where I had to fend for myself. It was the first time I found out that my mother was not just American, she was some sort of white lady. I was called Zebra. They chased me because my hair wasn't tight enough. They beat me to a pulp every day. Now, normally, a person would think, man, that's really bad. I feel so sorry for you. But see, that's not how I want you guys to leave this room. Think of the positives of what happened. My father sent us to the Ninth Ward, and I learned to run really fast. <laughs> I learned to climb the tallest pecan tree. I got good at it. And I decided that I was going to not be what they thought I was. They thought I was a loser. They thought I was some weirdo from an island that wasn't even bigger than Maryland. The Philippines is tiny. America's like this. Philippines. We could walk across the island. And then they dropped me into Ninth Ward, New Orleans, and I learned snap, dab, fast what America really was. There were different colors and they all treated each other differently. And that scared the heck out of me because I wasn't used to it. I'm a military brat. We were all equals. The only thing different with military was you have enlisted parents and officer parents. And that was the only thing I knew of. I learned very quickly that life is hard. And it is, it's hard. There's all sorts of things that you guys deal with, we all deal with, health, school, life, family. And now we have gender inequality, racial inequality. There's so much, so much, everything. Life's hard. It's really, really hard. I like the shake, I like the shake. But what I realized was, you don't have to be the circumstances that you're put in. Let me back up on that. You are not what people think you are. 
Because if I was who I was told I was, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. Were any of you here for the speech right before me, the doc that was here? Okay, not a lot of you, but a couple of you. He and I have very similar stories. But I grew up in a family with six children. My father, although he escaped the Ninth Ward, the uh, nice version of Harlem, although he escaped and he became successful, he got his master's degree, he got a doctorate. He was a chief master sergeant in the Air Force, the highest rank you can be as an enlisted person. Although he escaped all of that, he brought his mentality with him. Do you understand by, what I mean by that? I grew up and he labeled every one of us. My oldest brother was the musician. He was talented. My next brother was the athlete. He could do no wrong. My sister got all the tall jeans. She's a model. She's a beauty queen. She was gore She's gorgeous. And it came to me and my father said, good thing you're smart because you're short, you're fat, and you're ugly. And doors open only for beautiful people. When I got accepted to the Air Force Academy, I was so thrilled. I'm like, Dad, Dad, look. So I'm something he'd be proud of me for. I got into the Academy, and he said, why in the world would you take a spot from some young man that needs it to feed his family? Don't waste your time. You're just going to be barefoot and pregnant anyways. Shut up and go back to your room. Now what would that do to your average human? Why am I here? Why do I exist? I might as well die because I'm ugly. I'm short, I'm fat. No man will ever want me because he said I'm pig-headed. I always broke my mind. What did that leave me? It left me nothing. My father didn't love me. My mother was too scared to fight him. And then he sends us off to Louisiana to fend for ourselves. Now, what I did was, I'm a really good student. It was just something I could do. It was the only thing I could do, apparently. So I threw myself in school. Not because I thought I could do something with myself. I threw myself in there because I didn't want to go home. Two years later, after my father sent us to Louisiana, he came back to get us. And he said, oh, I love you guys. I miss my kids. Oh, I can't believe I sent you to Louisiana. Oh, come home. I love you. Blah, 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 blah. But as a little girl, I wanted to believe him. I wanted to. I was, I was nine. I, I wanted my dad. So I forgave him, and I, we all went back home. Well, as I got older, I found, I kept finding things. Anybody ever take the change out of your father's wallet or a little change thing? Well, my dad always threw change out of his pocket on his dresser, and I would always go get the change, because that's that was my allowance. Well, one day, I went to go get the change from my dad's stuff, and I hit his wallet, and it opened, it fell. And in it was a picture of my teacher in a bikini. I'm nine, and I said, Daddy, why do you have a picture of my teacher? And he said, Get the hell out of my room! What are you doing touching my stuff? You see that fear you felt? He threw me across the room. He threw me across the room because I caught him in a lie. I caught him. And I asked, I asked a simple question, why do you have a picture of my teacher? The next day, I went to school, and being the pig-headed daughter that I am, I went to my teacher. And 
I said, <laughs> all I remember is her first name was Barbara. I'm sorry for anyone whose name is Barbara, but I do not like Barbara's. <laughs> I have, there's something about it. I went up to Miss, whatever her name is, Barbara, and I said, why, do, why does my dad have a picture of you? And she said, you're just a stupid little pig-headed little girl. You are so stupid, I'm moving you back. You will never succeed in this world. That was my teacher. And I told, I told my friend, I said, I'm stupid. So what am I supposed to do? I'm stupid. And my friend said, you're not stupid. I said, yeah, I am. My dad said so. The teacher said so. And so that afternoon, I went to Mrs. Timmius's. I say this is where I'm getting at. Mrs. Timmius's had a um, classroom. Mrs. Timmius had a python. She had a 15-foot python. And every day after school, I would go there and feed it chickens. Well, I'm there one day, and I told her I was crying, and she said, what's going on with you? And I said, well, the teacher said I was stupid, and they're moving me back to first grade because I can't read or write, and I'm stupid. And she said, baby, you're not stupid. So she tested me. She made me come to class after school with her, and she had me reading these books and testing me every day. And what we found out was I was actually reading and doing math at a college level, and I was only in, like, third grade. I was super smart. <laughs> and when Ms. Timia said, now who told you you were stupid? And I told her, the teacher and my daddy. And she said, well, that makes no sense. And I said, well, I think she got mad because I told her about the bikini picture my dad had. Ms. Timia did not take well to that. Three days later, the teacher disappeared. And I came home from school and the security police were at the door of my house. They had packed all of our bags, and they kicked us out of the Philippines again. This time, they said my mother was a whore, our ch all of their children were stupid, and they carted us off again from the Philippines, the only place I really knew. Now, again, that's a lot going on for a little girl. But what I did is I found more adults that believed in me. You see, I couldn't find my mother. I loved my mom, but she was just a victim of my father, as the rest of us were. I didn't figure that out until I was in my 40s, but she was a victim too. He had controlled us all. And so what I'm trying to get out is, Don't let other people tell you who you are. You've got to find it in yourself. You know what you're capable of doing. And if you let other people, even someone who supposedly loves you, tell you that you're no good, walk away. You rock is what kept me alive. R, you have to be realistic. When someone was telling, my father would tell me I was an idiot, or he said you were smart, but because he said everything else negative, all I could hear was the negative. You have to be realistic. He said I wasn't worth anything, but yet I was really good at school. I was really good at playing music. I could sing. There were things that I could do that he never gave me credit for. Don't let the situation or the de event define you. I'm still hesitating on if I want to tell you the next story. But R, remember it, realistic. If something negative is happening in your life, does it really apply? You can feel it in your gut. When you do, that's not me. It's not you. You know you. R, realistic. O is O what? Oh yeah, that's the power phrase. When I realized that R-O-C-K was going to save my life, that's how I felt. So when someone says, you can't, my first instinct is, then I will. 
You see, my father said that I would never succeed. No man would ever want me, right? Well, I went back, I went to school. I went through straight A's. I went and got my, my bachelor's, eventually my master's, and working on my doctorate. Why? Because I can. Because I had to prove to myself that he was wrong. And also, because he has a doctorate, I've got to beat him. <laughs> but oh, you have to be optimistic. No matter how many things happen to you, you have to believe that there's a better way. And like my father, although he was very, very negative, I had to be optimistic that his way was the wrong way. And that there were other people out there who knew the right way. So, we all have friends, right? And you hear the problems that each of them have in their house. And one girlfriend would say, Ah, oh, yeah, my father always makes me watch 60 Minutes with them. Guys, I hate that. And my other girlfriend would say, And my mom, she makes me like pluck her eyebrows. Oh my god, I hate that. And I would always be so quiet. Because mine was, well, if I come home too early, I'm going to catch my dad beating my mom. Big difference, right? So I was known as the very quiet kid in school. Because <laughs> I didn't know how to share because I thought we were normal. And then I found out that not everybody gets hurt. So you have to be optimistic that there's a better way. There always is another way. If you don't like it, it doesn't feel right, you're right. It's not right. Find another way. So when you're surrounded by all those neg negative, negative people, in my case it was my entire family, because we all believed my father's lie that we were all useless in different ways. I sat there saying, there's got to be another way. Now, don't laugh at me, but I grew up in the Philippines, right? Uh, we were 20 years behind all of you in America. So in the 80s, when the rest of you guys, well, you guys weren't even alive. <laughs> but in the 80s, when the rest of the world was like going into pop music and things, we were still watching Little House on the Prairie. Do you know what that show is? And we were still watching MASH and Star Trek. Yeah! So I had no idea that the world was moving ahead of me. And so I thought, I'm going to get her up, and when I grow up, I'm going to get married, and I'm going to find somebody, and we're going to live like the Brady Bunch. Delusional. <laughs> but I wanted polar opposite of the hell that I lived in. Polar opposite. Anything better than this, I'll take it. But be optimistic. There is a better way. Now, C is courage. And the reason I say courage is, if I had never spoke up about my father and the teacher, that lady would have kept putting me back. I had to have the courage to speak up and tell people that something was wrong. And when you find, let's say, a new way of doing things, if you know it, you have to be strong enough and believe in yourself to pursue it. Let me see. I'm going to go through these slides because I want to tell you a story. Now, that's what I see in the mirror every day. Although I looked in the mirror and hated what I saw, I could feel that there was something bigger and stronger inside of me. There was a purpose and I just needed to find out what it is. And honestly, Ladies and gentlemen, you are my purpose. You're my purpose because, I'm not telling you even nearly half of my story, but I want to let you know that no matter what you are facing, school, family, whatever fear you have, it is definitely in you to make it happen. stands for knowledge. And the reason I have knowledge in there is because no matter how terrible 
or wonderful an event was. You have to learn from it. Now you see, remember I said I lived in the Philippines. In the Philippines, we had two rules at school. You must wear something on your feet. Usually it was just flip-flops. And drugs and alcohol were fully rampant. And my brother was really into drugs. <laughs> he was a musician. But it was everywhere. You had to make the decision for yourself, in our cases, if we were going to be part of the church crowd, part of the athletic crowd, or the smoking, drinking, drug crowd. I tried to run it all. I actually did it for a while until I realized the drug and alcohol way was probably not the good path because then I would be just like my father, right? My whole purpose in life was to not be my father. So if I did the drug and alcohol side, granted he didn't do drugs, but he definitely did the alcohol, I would be him. So I watched my friends. My job was, I made it my job, to make sure that my friends got home safely after running through the bars, right? I took the responsibility to be the voice of logic. So whenever we'd say, hey, let's go to the bars, I'd say, we can go dancing, but don't drink. Oh, Michelle, you're such a bummer, get out of here. But someone needs to be the voice of reason in all the fun chaos, right? So knowledge. I learned that you don't drink and drive because my friends almost killed themselves. They were driving home from the base, off base, and one of them fell asleep at the wheel, flipped the car, two of them died, but it was because they were drinking and driving. Big lesson, don't drink and drive, right? Another girl really liked this guy, and well, we're on base, we're at this point, we're close to 16, 17. Well, most airmen are 18. Do you know that? A lot of the new Air Force guys are really young, right? <laughs> well, they dated the high schoolers. So here you have young men who are off on their own in the military, and young high school girls who really have no other choices but the guys in the high school. We only have one high school. There's only 30 people in our graduating class. So they think, Wow, that, that military guy's really cute, he's got money, and he's got this, and they would sleep with these, Ar these Air Force and Army and Navy guys. Well, a lot of them got pregnant. Well, lesson learned. Don't do what they do, right? <laughs> it was just simple. I, taking advice from parents and adults is hard, but watching other people make mistakes is the best lesson I've ever seen. And I've learned from adults and children alike. Learn from it. If you are having any experience at all, if you don't come out with a plan on how not to do it and some goals, you know that whole smart goal thing? It's the magic of life. Write down your, your goals and what you want out of life. Because you have to gain knowledge. Just piece everything together. Get new ideas. And then, rock. Resilient, optimistic, courageous, knowledge. Okay, no more PowerPoint for me. I am not a PowerPoint person. Now, here's, I'm going to share something that reshaped, reshaped my life. A lot of you are looking into going to college, right? Who here wants to go to college? All of you. Okay. How many of you think that it's just going to be a free-for-all go, be free from your parents, and you can do whatever you want for the rest of your life? No. The thing is, is when you go to college, you've got to make your own decisions. You have to make the right decisions, even to the point that you need to know the people you hang around with. You know that whole birds of a feather flock together? Right? 
even more so in college. It will make or break you. If you want to be successful in school, you better surround yourself with people who believe in you, who are also wanting to be successful in school. You see, my father, man, he's going to find me. He's going to be so mad. But my father at 16 kicked me out. He said I was a whore. Why? Because I spent the night at my friend's house. Her name was Robin. He believed Robin was a boy's name and that I was a whore. So he kicked me out at 16. What can you do at 16? Can you sign a lease? Do you have a job that can pay for a car or a rental? Anything? Nothing. The only reason I found a place to live is because Robin, the woman I was staying with, who was only a year older than me, let me in. I'm getting to this. Robin was dating a fraternity guy. And I used to go to the parties with them because that's what you do, right? And I'm with a group of people and I figured, you know, they're all fraternity guys. We all know each other, so I'm safe. I went down the hallway to go to the restroom, and as I came out of the restroom, one of the guys was standing at the door. Well, if you can't tell, I'm five foot. I'm not tall. I'm not a fighter. I come out of the restroom, and this guy is standing there. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, and I tried to move out of the way. He grabbed me, pushed me back into the restroom, and would have done far more to me if I didn't know how to kick people in places that hurt. <laughs> what I'm saying is, never take your eye off the ball. You want an education? You want more? You have to seek more. Surround yourself with the people who want more, and you will grow. If you succumb every once in a while to the the craziness of college and the party life, which, you know what I'm saying, live, you can go do that. Girls don't be alone. Boys don't be alone. There are some freaky people in this world. <laughs> there are, don't laugh too much. They're crazy, a lot of them are. You need to get your radar on to figure out who they are and stay away from them. Now here's the other one. To go to college because my father said that women are useless and that we should not be taking the space of a nice young man who needs the education. He refused. He well, kicked me out. He took my military ID, so I didn't have insurance. But what I did is I got four jobs. I worked at Child Protective Services. I typed up the reports for the social workers. Overnight, I would work at the intake room where they would bring the abused children and let them, well, it was a safe house. I worked part-time at a bank, at a credit union actually, and then I had a fourth job at a steak restaurant. Why did I work four jobs? I wanted to go to school. I wanted it more than anything because I'm not stupid. It's the only thing I've got, right? According to my father, it's all I've got. I worked four jobs. I worked hard. Well, I worked hard enough that I got myself a studio apartment at 18. I was so proud of myself. I was in Omaha, Nebraska. And I had an apartment. No one else that worked the waitress, the wait staff at the steakhouse had one. So one night they're like, hey Michelle, you know, we should all get together and have a party. And I said, well, you know, I want I got school and I've got work tomorrow. I'm like, oh, she'll just live a little, girl. We'll just live a little. Let's have a party. Like, okay, we'll have a party. Everybody come over to my house. We'll play cranium. <laughs> Woohoo! I'm a party animal. So they all came over and played cranium. And as we're playing cranium, and the, the night gets older, I said, yeah, later, I said, you know, guys, it's like one o'clock, and I have to be at my first math class like at seven in the morning. So if I can at least get three hours of sleep, that would be good. You guys need to go, right? Go. Everybody left. Well, Omaha, Nebraska, it's cold. There's a knock on the door. I said, who is it? Hey, it's me. Uh, I forgot my coat. 
can I, uh, can I come in? I need my coat. So where's your coat? So I, I hung it up. Well, I'm not gonna open the door. Because, I don't know, I, I just got this feeling I'm not gonna open the door. So I looked in the closet, I don't see a coat. I said, hey, uh, Joe, I don't see a coat, what are you talking about? Oh, uh, I put it higher up in the closet, so uh, I'll have to come in and get it. So I unlock the door, and he comes in, and sure enough, he goes to the closet, and he goes into the top shelf, and he pulls his coat down. And then he hops over my couch, and sits on the couch, and starts watching TV, and I said, Joe, you gotta go. I have to go to school, and I've got you know, work after that. And he says, what you watching? I'm like, uh, it's bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? And I said, well, I'm watching this while I'm getting ready for bed. And he goes, huh, well, you should sit here next to me. I'm like, I don't wanna sit next to you, I want you to leave. And then he pulled out a gun. And he said, you will sit next to me. So I sat next to him. Not gonna fight a gun, right? Well, I get to the chair next to him, and he puts the gun up to my head, and he says, you'll do what I want you to do. Now, this is why I told you, college has some really crazy people. That night lasted, and I'm not joking, nine months. Every day, for nine months, that man raped me. Over and over and over. And I worked at a child protective service. I worked behind secure doors, and he would wait for me and get me as soon as I came out of work. Now, you're thinking, why didn't this girl ask for help? Why didn't this girl fight? One, I'm not stupid. You can't kick a gun, right? The other thing was, I have brains. It's all I've got. And if he blows them out, what do I have? Nothing. Then the other thing I thought was, Dad's right. I'm useless. Now this is far before I figured out this whole ROCK. Because I lived in torture for years with this. Because I just... I believed, I believed I was useless. And this is why I say, you need to surround yourself with people who believe in you. In you. Do you have people like that? Do you have people who believe in you? And I'm not talking people who do, yeah man, and they're just kind of half there. The people who are there when really, really things get bad, those are the people you want in your life. Those are the people who care. Those are the people who realize that when your personality changes, that something's wrong. I happen to have one person in my life that realized that. For those of you who, oh no, I did a TEDx. Do you know what that is? I did a TEDx for TEDx Colorado Springs. Look me up, Michelle Moross, TEDx. I told a little bit of that story. The boy I met in the Philippines, a friend of mine, he never lost touch with me. And when all this was happening with this Joe guy, Michael would call and he would say, are you okay? I'm fine, everything's fine, I just need to go, I've got to stay. But every week he would call and say, are you okay? I do. Yeah, I'm fine, he said, you're lying to me, I know it, you're lying to me. I'm like, no, I'm fine. Well, I would say I was fine because Joe had a gun on me and he would record, he would watch and listen for every phone call I was on. So I did, no, I'm fine, everything's great, yeah, yeah, Joe's wonderful, yeah, we're gonna get married, yeah, mm-hmm. And inside I'm doing, oh my God! Save me, save me, save me, somebody notice something, something's wrong. But I didn't know how to say it because I was scared. Don't be scared. You guys live in a world where you can actually say something and people will listen. When I called the cops when George was hurting me, you know what they told me? You're his girlfriend? No, sir, I'm not. Well, that's your word against his. We don't, we don't deal with domestic disputes. 
and a cop hung up on me. I was left alone. Alone, alone, alone. And that's why I say you have to be really resist resilient. You have to come back. It has to come from you. Granted, I'm hoping that no one else has to go through what I, th I went through. Rape is very, very extreme, right? But that makes everything else look pretty darn easy. Don't you think? If you can survive something that terrible, you can survive anything. So put your problems in perspective. Put it, put it in layers. So I'm trying to figure out what, what kind of things would you guys say, give me a problem, someone give me a problem. Something that you would like to get over. Anybody? Come on. Bueller? 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 Yes, sir. That your parents don't believe in you? A problem that your parents don't believe in you. If you want to put the rock against that, resilient, you have teachers that believe in you. You have other adults. You have people at church. You have the mailman. In my case, I had a grocery lady. I called her the baloney lady. But there are people who say and see you that believe in you. If your parents don't believe in you, find someone who does. That Michael that I told you would call and ask me what's going on? I married that man. It took me many, many, many years. <laughs> Smartest decision of my life. But you know, the reason that I married this man, I actually said no. He's the polar opposite of my father. So my father looks, does anyone know what Lou Gossett Jr. looks like? Nope. Big black man! My dad's huge! I married a little white man. <laughs> yes, I would have nightmares of big black men, I don't know. I'm much, we're much better about it now. Believe it or not, I used to actually tell him, talk, I actually talk to my dad. I go to him all the time now. And what we realized is, I told my father, you know, I don't appreciate how you raised us. I mean, guys, I'm old, I'm 47, okay? I told him, I don't believe in how you raised us. But what I realized is that when we're born, no one gives us a manual on how to raise a child. The only thing we have to raise a child is our own experience, right? So with my father, although I hated him at the time, I went and talked to him and asked him, why did you treat us like dirt? Why were we second-class citizens when all these strangers thought you were the most wonderful human in the world? Why did you treat us like this? I hate you. And he said, I didn't know better. That's the truth. He grew up in the ninth ward of Louisiana. His idea of parenthood was when he was 13, his mother sent him off to the levee to live with his single uncle who was a womanizer. Why? Because she wanted him out of the ninth ward so he would have a chance. And what she did is she moved him out of family, out of church, out of anything stable that he would have had and put him in another place well, yeah, she put him in another place for hit the better for him, but he learned worse habits. No, he didn't do drugs and alcohol, but he learned womanizing and that women were only objects. He didn't know. And although he went through all that schooling, he's so, so smart. My father's brilliant. Common sense was not something that he was taught. You are not taught common sense in school, right? You learn common sense by getting kicked. Don't stand behind the horse, it hurts, right? Don't walk in front of cars that are moving, they'll kill you. So you have to use yourself. You are the beginning and the end. And the people that you surround yourself is the beginning and the end. You rock. Because every time you have a problem, you need to reevaluate. So basically, the reason I say this is a leadership course is because leadership 
revolves around conflict resolution. You don't know that, do you know that term, conflict resolution? Okay, conflict resolution, this is my simple terms, rock. When a problem happens, you look at it, you look at it in a realistic view. What are the ways we can fix this? A, B, C, D, right? Now, if A doesn't work, do we have an alternate plan? If, you know, B doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. If just have a strategy for every possible outcome. You need to be resilient enough to see that there's another way. O, being optimistic, you've got to not only see that other way with your plan, those SMART goals that you have, you have to be optimistic about it because guess what? What you say you are, what do I say, Matt? What you say you are, you are. Do not self-talk yourself down. I'm the queen of that, but I was. Because that little voice in the back of your head that says you can't, will rule your mind. Because every time an opportunity comes out that you can stand up and do something big, try something else, jump and gain wings, that little voice will say, you're not good enough. Or you didn't pass that test, there's no way you could do this. Or oh, you got a C in that class, so you're obviously not good at that. Don't listen to any of those voices because guess what? They're wrong. Turn off that voice. I want you to look in the mirror and see that you are you. You are very uniquely you. And each one of you in this room and outside of this room all have a gift that you're meant to share with the world. Your goal when you're in college or going to, going to go to college, your goal is to find out what is your gift. Are you really good at talking to people? Are you really good at feeling when someone's feeling bad? What, what are the strengths? Are you really good with, like with me, what I found out in college? I'm really good at building things. I went to school for engineering. I can't do math worth a barn, but I can build. Physics was my thing. But I would have never believed in that because my father says I couldn't have done that because why? It's a man's job. Do you believe there are men's jobs and women's jobs? Oh, heck no. The only thing that a woman, a man can't do that a woman can do is give birth. Other than that, we're all equal. Because I think women are mean. I think the guys are probably going to agree with that, right? Women are mean. Yeah, that's because we're honest. <laughs> but you have to be optimistic with your goals. You've got to believe in them. So when you're writing your SMART goals, realize just because you think you can't doesn't mean you should not write that down. Because there will be a day when you realize you can't. Having the courage to do things. Standing in front of you today would have been an impossibility for me about six years ago. And I would say that because every time I went into a crowd, I saw Joe. Every man in this room looked like Joe. And it terrified me. But I realized Joe was in my past. And if I ever run into him again, I'll know what to do. I won't cower because now I don't believe what my father said. I'm not useless. He was wrong. You know why my father was wrong? Because we talked together and he said I was, he was a fool. He was a fool and he admitted it. Granted, he's 77 when he finally did admit that he was a fool, but he finally did say he was sorry. But those bad words that my father said to me shaped the way I saw people. It shaped the people I hung around with. It shaped the things I let people get away with around me. I let people abuse me because I didn't recognize it as abuse. Like I said, I'm 47, so I grew up in an age where we didn't talk openly about abuse at all. It never happened back in the 70s. We didn't talk about it. So in order to be part of any abuse at all, 
you would be shy. So I didn't talk about it. No one talked about it. See, you have the gift of having a world where people will listen. You can do anything you want to do. You do believe that, right? And if you don't believe it, I want you to look in the mirror every day and say something positive about yourself. Something positive because everything you say to yourself is true. So if you say something negative, your, your brain doesn't know any better. It will believe it. Now let's flash, flash forward. Is that word? Is that word? Fast forward. Last year, May, May 21st actually, I, I used to, well, I work political campaigns, I'm a writer. And I'm working on a, two or three campaigns, I'm balancing books for the church, I'm really, really busy and I'm sitting at my computer just losing my mind about everything that's going on around me and realizing that I've bitten off more than I can chew. And the time popped up on my phone that I need to go pick up my kids. And for those of you who've seen my TEDx, you know what I'm going to. You see, I was overwhelmed by everyone else's problems. I like to say that I'm a problem solver, so therefore, I solve problems for other people. That I put myself behind the needs of everybody else. Try not to do that. You have to come first. You know, you know the airlines when they say, when the oxygen mask comes down, please put on your mask and then help others? Been on an airplane, guys? Yeah? You haven't been on an airplane? Well, on the airplane they say, if anything changes in the pressure, an oxygen mask will fall from the ceiling. Please put on your mask and then help or assist younger or older people around you that need help. It's the same thing with life. You can't help other people if you don't have the oxygen mask on you. So in life, I want you to take care of you first. Make sure you're sleeping, make sure you're doing, you're eating right, make sure you're getting your studies done before you help other people. Because if you're not helping yourself, you're breaking yourself down and getting carried away with other things. Well anyways, last year that's what I was doing. And I was driving along to go pick up my kids from high school when a young girl ran a stop sign. She totaled my car. And when I woke up from that, I wasn't able to speak. And if you can tell, I love to talk. <laughs> and I couldn't speak. As I'm sitting in my living room, crying to myself, thinking about how useless I am, all of those negative voices that I managed to push out of my head throughout the years all came back. I'm lazy because I can't move, I'm too dizzy. I can't speak so I can't even complain to anybody. I'm locked in my head. I was alone in my head thinking I was useless and had no purpose whatsoever. And then I realized when I started being able to talk that I was still talking gibberish, which means the brain that I so cherished was also lost. I was useless, I might as well be dead. That's where my brain went a year and a half ago. And as I was sitting on my chair complaining about how useless I am in my head, I found the gumption to get up. And that's where rock came from. You see, I had to find in me the belief that I could. And it's, it's a very hard thing to do, but I had a choice. I was going to either just shrivel up and die, or I was going to have to find another way. And what I do is I call it my new normal. I have a new normal. See, I have a TBI. Do you know what that is? It's a traumatic brain injury. I have what a lot of soldiers down in Fort Carson go to the Wounded Warrior Center for. I have no short-term memory. I also have no filter. <laughs> so I un unfortunately say whatever is on my mind. And my poor child up front's probably doing, yeah, no filter. So although I have a brain injury and I can't remember anything, so at this whole session, I'll forget you. But next week, I'll remember every face. Weird how the brain works, right? But I needed to be able to get out of that 
rep to get out of that mess that I put myself in after that accident. I had to be realistic, okay? I cannot remember short-term things anymore. Okay, so I have to wipe this off my plate. How can I handle that? Well, we all have smartphones, right? I started recording things that I needed. I started putting things in my phone that alerts would come up and remind me to do things. I found the Wounded Warrior Center and begged them to let me in and said, listen guys, I need help. They said, well, you're talking just fine. It's like, no, I'm talking fine right now, but give me till one o'clock when my brain gets tired and I won't be able to talk anymore. Sure enough, they see me at one o'clock and I'm, I'm really, it's amazing how your brain will just stop. My brain stopped. I went through a lot of therapy to get this brain to start talking again to the demise of my husband and my children. They still love me. But I had to find, I had to get back up. So I had to be resilient to find another way. Find another way. If anything says you can't do it, then find another way. Because if someone like, oh, Einstein, just sat back and listened to what people told him he was and what he couldn't do, we wouldn't have what we have from him now. Find another way. You have to be optimistic. You have to believe that it can happen, that you can get better. I believed that I could get better. I didn't know at what level I would get better. I just knew I could get better. Be optimistic. See, you have to have the courage to try. With me, I pushed myself on a limb by speaking. I decided that since I couldn't, when I got my voice back, that maybe the powers that be wanted me to talk about TBIs because there's so many people with concussions and problems I can't talk anymore or have great difficulty. Well, I had the courage to do it. I came out here and I wanted to talk and I did that TEDx to talk about it. Now K is the knowledge. You gotta gain knowledge from every experience that you have, good or bad. Find, find the reason. There's a reason for everything. And even though it's a bad experience, good can come out of it. Now, what else? What? Oh. <laughs> I want to make sure I finish on time because you guys have a really far hike to go through. Do you have any questions about? Yes, sir. How did I forgive my father? If that what? Oh, I forgave him. Now the thing is, he asked me, "How did I forgive my father?" I forgave my father because I realized whenever I would think about the past, it hurt me more than it hurt him. Really, that was it. I would dwell on my past, and go, oh, he, he was a bad dad, he hurt my mom, he was a jerk, he was a womanizer, and then I realized all that did was make me hate other people. And that's why I went to him and said, you know, I need to know why. Did you do it because you were just an evil human, or did you do it because you just didn't know? And when we had that discussion, it was a long discussion, it was hard, I told him, and he told me, he was sorry for everything he did. And I told him, you know, I don't believe that people can change. I really don't. And that I said, I forgive you for being the terrible father that you are. But what I ask of you is with your new family, not to repeat your mistake. Did you at least learn from what you've done to the six of us? And he said, Yes, ma'am, I have. We have a very amicable <laughs> relationship. It, it was, it's a tough thing to do. There's a hand way up there. I'm actually just finished writing a book. It's called Eat, Drink, and Be Merry. And it is about, it's actually based off my TEDx talk. So look up Michelle Moross and TEDx, and you'll see bits and pieces of it. And then my second book will be about my actual military child life and everything I've gone through. But uh, yeah, I, I, I invested in something called Dragonware so I could talk it instead of type it. <laughs> Any fans? Yes? Joe? Oh my. Joe is scary. Uh, they wouldn't let me do a 
Omaha does not have a restraining order of law. So he followed me around for many, many years. We have time, right? No time. Oh, I've got time. Just a little bit. Okay, here's a story. Joe. I told you the whole gun thing. He was always with me with the gun. And Joe was very insecure. Joe, Joe wanted to be with someone bigger and better than him. He always said that I was smarter than him and where he came from, that you are the person you date. So he wanted to stay with me and he wanted me to love him and the only way he knew how to make me love him was by force. And one day I came in and I told him, you know Joe, I love you. He said, oh man, Michelle, I'm so glad you love me. You finally love me. I said, yeah, I love you. But you know, you don't need that gun anymore. And I asked him, you know, if you sold the gun to my brother, we could run away together. And so that next day, I said, we need to go to church because that's where my brother's going to be. We went to church, and my brother came up to hug me. And I hugged my brother, and in his ear, I whispered, buy the gun. looked at me. George came back. He said, hey, man, I've got a gun to sell you. I was wondering, you know, how much would you give me? And my brother handed him $500 and took the gun. Now, my brothers know me. And as I went into church, I noticed that my brothers and Joe never came in. Then I noticed the pastor leave. What I found out was my brother did not know what happened to me, but he knew I wanted that gun out. And so they jacked him up and told him <laughs> if he ever came near me again, that they would never find his body. <laughs> and I've never seen him again. <laughs> I know that so, I, I laugh about it, but man, for years and years and years, I watched every car, every red car, and I would jump. I, I, I was scared. He had me so programmed to be scared by him. Even his smell and his accent, I know it. It still makes me jump. But I smile about it because I rock. I'm resilient, optimistic about the future. I have the courage to stand up to whomever will ever hurt anyone again. And I gained knowledge about the people that I hung around with really quick. I learned a lot about Joe. And I learned about the strength in me because of Joe. I would never wish that on any other, any other human again. But I will definitely talk about it. I will scare you with my big voice. Because you need to know that you can make it through anything. Any other questions? Oh, are you standing for a reason? You're just done. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Kind of relationship I have with my mother? Pretty good, actually. She doesn't believe that she was a victim of anything, but I've done a lot of soul searching, and so I've talked to my mother and let her know, you know, that what she went through she should not be embarrassed about. And remember, she's a Filipino, so she's got, she's Asian, and her Asian descent gives her a lot of, she's very conservative. So for the world, She's probably really mad at me for right now saying that my father hurt her ever. But the reason we have a great relationship is that we were both, we were all victims. And that my mother knows now that she also rocks because all six of her children grew up successful. Not, I mean, despite what my father tried to do with us, we're all successful in our own way because we all found what we, our gifts were. My oldest brother is a musician. He's doing very well. My next brother is an engineer. My sister is actually up here in Denver, and she's a, a real estate agent. And then me as a speaker and an author. And the twins, I, I, they're the twins, and they're the babies, but they're 37. <laughs> yeah, but they're also you know, engineers, and they're, they're doing really well. And my mother's relationship with all of us is amazing. This is, as soon as I kick my father out of the house, Everything, everything set in. Any other questions? Because here is it. This is a song that used to 
bring me peace and pain at the same time. You ever heard that song, I believe the children are our future. Yeah. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a chance. That, that song used to make me cry. Because I knew inside of me that there was something in me and there's something in every one of you. And I wanted to tell you that if you ever listen to that song, find yourself in it because we are the future. I was the future at one point and we brought you to at least to this point. Now you guys need to fix what we've done <laughs> and keep going forward. You hold the torch for the future. And remember, you rock. And for those of you who actually have the paper, I only had like 50 handouts. Remember that, I don't know if I can read that. I gave out a handout and I said, if, you might have seen it on Facebook, if A, B, C all the way through Z equals one, two, three, all the way up to 26, have you heard of those? Okay, because I wrote, it's attitude. Rock is an attitude. You had to sh I had to shift my attitude, and I suggest that you all shift your attitude for whatever occurs in your life, and you'll rock it. And Sarah just asked me to have you all bring the, what are those, the questionnaires? Oh, if you can bring the evaluations down here to Sarah in the purple shirt.